So today I thought I'd do a quick review of the Hockney exhibition that's on at Take Britain at the moment, which I managed to go to a few days ago. Um, you get this little booklet with it. Um, it shows you that there are 12 rooms. Didn't really seem like 12 rooms to be honest, but maybe, maybe that's because it seemed a little bit inconsequential. Um, and I decided to split this review up into three parts, the good, the bad and the ugly. So let's get to it. So the good, what was good about it? Well, overall, he didn't do the same thing from his earlier stuff to his later stuff. So that's good, unlike a loose and forward exhibition, I seems to remember seeing a retrospective that seems just to be the same painting over and over again for like 60 years. Good work was the digital stuff and the photographic stuff. He did this great, this great thing with photos, um, especially the Polaroid things that he did in the 80s, I think it was, where he is kind of like, you know, um, photographic cubism in a way, um, took loads of photos, put them all together to create these images. And with the Polaroids, um, it seemed to work especially well because you end up with this, with well, the way he put them together, you've got the grid around um, the actual, the white space around the actual image, which once they're put together, kind of made a grid. And that, that looked really good. It's like a prism, looking through the prism, like someone looking through someone else's eyes. Um, and I thought they were really good. They were, you know, some of my favourite stuff there. And then, so that's the kind of early stuff before the digital uh, kind of revolution came. So then the digital stuff, there was these uh, moving portraits, is the only way I can think of it, of the landscape. And he did winter... Uh, spring, summer and autumn. It's all the same roads, like country lane somewhere in Yorkshire. I don't know where it was and really look to see where it was. It's, it doesn't really matter. So clearly what he did was, and you can see this, you've got these very large screens. Each, So it's set up in a room. Each wall has its own work of art there. And you get nine screens as a grid. Imagine like big flat screens, like nine of them all arrayed. Uh, as a grid and you can imagine the way he actually made these moving images was by attaching nine cameras to a car and drove very slowly down this country lane and you get this great is this the great effect of um, you know the way things move because of the camera lens and stuff and they're all pointing in different directions you get this weird kind of three-dimensional idea of the landscape you're going through and that works that worked really well uh, so they, they were good I thought they were they were I think the best things well no actually those and the photographs are the best things um, and later on you get the iPad paintings which actually were pretty good a lot better than his normal paintings I think it must be something to do with the way he could control the opacity of the colors that he was using but it just seemed to me that they worked much better. They had like recording, like him drawing on the iPad and the final image, you know, that was like recorded as he was doing it. So you could see the image being created, which, you know, some, some people is fascinating. Um, to me, not, not so fascinating because, you know, that's the kind of thing that I do um, every day. Um, but what was interesting to me was that the final image, as seen on a screen, um, were a lot more effective than the printed image because they had the printed image, printed images above the um, like the iPad creation um, kind of thing that you could see. Yeah, and the printed version, they, they just didn't work. The colours are far more dulled. He obviously hasn't got to grips with how you um, can paint digitally um, while still uh, maintaining an image that can be printed out properly and whereby the colours will work. The printed versions, you know, they really didn't work, I don't think. But the ones that were on screen that you could see, very good. And, you know, that whole thing of watching someone actually do it, you know, it's not a video of seeing him with an iPad doing it. You're just seeing what is on the iPad screen, essentially. You know, it's recording the screen. And what was funny to me was, you know, people were like, wow, isn't that fascinating? About 15, 20 years ago, I wrote my own computer program to do just that. It's kind of fascinating, but it, it goes back to this thing. I'm sure that he, he has seen a film um, of Picasso work and called Le Mystère Picasso, um, which is fantastic. You know, if you get a chance to see that, do, do see it. 
where you could watch um, Picasso creating these things. And there's time lapse, but there's also these live scenes of him working where it was done by him working on translucent screens that were filmed from the back. So you don't see him, but you just, it's, all, it's just like you know, watching the screen, like a, you know, um, recording the screen output, just like you did on the iPad. All right, so that's the good stuff. Photographs, the photographic uh, composition works. Um, they, I really like them, especially the Polaroid ones. Um, there's a very famous one uh, for Desert that he did, and I didn't like that so much. I found that it was a bit washed out. To be honest, I just don't think it worked quite as well. I think something about the Polaroids, the um, the chemical process that they go through for the image to be created, um, gave the colours uh, kind of a real intensity that in his other photographic stuff that just used um, like normal 35 mil camera um, photographs, um, they just didn't didn't quite have in the same way. Um, although there is very one very kind of touching um, portrait of his mother that he did like that obviously out somewhere at some kind of ruined cathedral somewhere and she's like covered in um this kind of ov overall rain mac kind of thing looking rather cold and dejected it's quite a touching little image though i mean i wouldn't say it's great art to be honest um kind of stuff i have done in the past and you see students doing stuff it's you know it's, it's good but it's not not the best stuff in the world but you know Anyway, that's, that's his good stuff. Photographs and the digital stuff. So, the bad. Well, for me, the bad definitely has to be the painting. The very early stuff um, is just a typical kind of art school, scrawling, semi-abstract nonsense that so many people seem to do. It's not good, it's not clever, it's, it's not even worth looking at. <coughs> Moving swiftly on, um, eventually he got to the point where he's doing these portraits of um, clearly wealthy people out in um, Hollywood, Los Angeles, somewhere there. And they're done better. I think he clearly took a lot more care with those pictures because he's probably getting paid a lot of money to do them. But it so annoys me. This man, the way he, he can't use paint. He's not painting. He, he can't paint. The man can't paint. You see, like, he he's... So you've got a facility with image, right? He can do image and he can do portraits. He's good at portraits. He can get the lightness, he gets the character, but the way he paints is shit. He can't do it. And he's careless and lazy. And so you see things like with outlines of head and maybe some paint has gone astray, gone into the background, but it just kind of roughs it in. You can just see where he just couldn't be bothered to actually do it probably. Why? Probably because he painted the background first and painted the figure over the top. And so he hasn't got that colour mixed up properly or something. He just couldn't be bothered. Then you get the drips of paint here, there and all over the place. I just think it's poor. It's just poor craftsmanship. The man can't paint. He's clearly got no interest in paint. And I can't bear that. I'm a painter. I'm passionate about paint. You've got to use paint. Paint is a means for expression. It's not just a means for getting colour on a canvas. And that's all he was using it for. So even though these portraits... They're very impressive images, and they're very large, and that's always impressive. Oh, don't artists love a large bit of canvas? Oh, yes. Um, the paintings, as, a paint, as paintings, they're rubbish. They're not good paintings. They're graphic. Graphical. Sorry, that sounds a bit wrong. Um, they're illustrative. You know, that's the thing that it comes across more than anything else. And so the impression I'm left with is something that's rather kind of inconsequential and really kind of almost meaningless in a way. These almost seems like illustrations of people. You know, they are good for what they are, but they are not paintings. They're graphical portraits. That's the best way I can describe them. And I can't bear the way that he clearly paints the backgrounds of things first. Later on, you see these like pictures is... Um, more kind of landscapes and gardens and things like that and you can see how he's painted the background first and then painted the foreground over the top and I just think that's almost like a dereliction of duty you don't see that like when there's a wall behind something else and you're painting the view you can't see the wall that's behind yet he paints the wall that's behind and then paints the other things in front and that's just it doesn't make sense to me. And when you can actually see that, because with the paint, some pigments are more translucent than others, and you can see what he's painted behind, 
it just looks awful. I just think that he just doesn't know how to use paint properly, which is why, for some reason, I think the um, his iPad paintings are far better because he doesn't seem to have that problem with them. He can choose how um, opaque or not to make a colour, and he doesn't seem to have the same issue with, um, you know, getting repainting bits of background and stuff when things have gone over the edge or something and needs to tie something up. It doesn't seem to be so much of an issue, but when it comes to using paint, it is an issue. And later on, you know, these big um, multi-canvas uh, landscapes they did that were, he got, you know, a lot, lot of interest for a few years ago when he had uh, an exhibition at the Royal Academy. And I didn't see them. I was quite looking forward to seeing them, to see what they were like. Um, and you go into this room and sure, like 50, 60 feet away, um, these, these paintings look, look rather good. And that just shows you how image based they are, how they are illustrative, they're graphical they're not paintings because you get close up to them as soon as you can see the brush stroke they look shit they're rubbish the man can't paint did i say that before i might have mentioned it i don't think he can paint i think he's rubbish with paint doesn't know how to use paint i was hoping there would be some of his watercolors so i know a few years ago he did an awful lot of uh, watercolors and watercolor portraits i was quite looking forward to see seeing them because you can't do things with watercolor in the same way that you can with oil paint and um yeah, I was quite looking forward to seeing some of them, but there weren't any of them there. You know, there are a few like crayon things, maybe one or two watercolours from much earlier, but not the more recent ones. Um, so that was disappointing. The man can't paint. Paintings, bad. That's all I've got to say. So now we get to the ugly. And this isn't strictly speaking about the um, Hockney exhibition in itself but it's more to do with the galleries that put on these exhibitions. Tate Gallery, Modern and Britain, the National Gallery, the Royal Academy, all these big institutions in London, they put on these exhibitions. You see the posters all around the place, all on the underground, on the tubes, um, you know, on all these places where you see advertising on the street. And they never put the price on the poster. Ever wondered why? Well, if you've ever been to any of these exhibitions, you'll know exactly why. It's because they know if they put the price on the poster, no one would go. Because it was £19.50 to get into this exhibition. £19.50. We're talking 20 quid to go to this exhibition. Now, I, it, I'm not a rich man. I would not be able to go to this exhibition had it not been for the fact that I went with a friend a bugsy I'd go to most exhibitions with, who happened to have a member's pass so we could get into free. Had you not had that, I wouldn't have gone. There is, of course, a concessionary rate. Oh, yes, a concessionary rate. So if you're unemployed and living on, like, 70 quid a week, um, or you're a student, students have got loads of money, haven't they? Yeah, loads of money. Then you can get the concessionary rate, which is, you know, it's, it's a fantastic value. at £17.50. Two quid off. Who are they kidding? Who are they doing these exhibitions for? This is absolutely, this is turning art into elitist stuff. And that's why I can't stand. Art is inclusive. It should be for everyone. That's what art is. It's communication between people, human beings. It's not from rich to rich. This is all that this is. This institution's just going for the rich people. It's for the wealthy middle classes. When we went there, it was packed full of people. Packed. You could hardly see most of the pictures. And who was it packed with? Average age, over 60. Wealthy middle classes. And that's who they're doing these exhibitions for. And that pisses me off. It shouldn't be for them. It should be for everyone. £19.50 for this exhibition. That disgusts me. It should be £10 to get in. Concessions, £5. That's what they should do. Not charge so much. It's so wrong that they do that. It turns it into an elitist game rather than an inclusive cultural um, thing that everyone should be going to see, though not necessarily the Hockney, because not that great.